Greetings to all of you. My name is Arzu Osanlu. And I am Kabiri Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us. We are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities, and we welcome you to our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of the study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead the experiences in regions across the global south, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Over the course of the seminar, we compare the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and allow us to illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment constitute suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. Today's event is the first of three in the theme, Comparative Humanitarianisms. Here, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of other humanitarian logics shape when and how communities provide care to forced migrants. Our speakers ask us to explore a new global humanitarian project as one founded on diverse practices that recognize human suffering, the labor and principles of care, and the materials and affective expressions of caring. Thus, they invite us to examine the ethical systems, logics, and rationalities that underlie everyday practices of humanitarianism across cultural and religious traditions in the Global South. And we are delighted to welcome Professor Elena Fedian Asmia, who has conducted extensive research in refugee camps and urban hosting communities throughout the world, including in Algeria, Cuba, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Her presentation today focuses on the ubiquity of overlapping and consecutive displacements as a common feature of refugee experiences in the Global South. She argues that we need to pay heed to the relationships between refugees and providing aid and assistance, what she calls refugee-refugee humanitarianism. Our colleague, Gauche de Boudjou Ege, a dissertation fellow for this Sawyer seminar, will be the moderator of today's question and answer session. And we now turn to her to introduce our speaker to you. Thank you, Kabiri. It's a pleasure to welcome our invited speaker, Elena Fidian Kasmiye, Professor of Migration and Refugee Studies and co-director of the Migration Research Unit at University College London. She is also the director of the Refuge in a Moving World internationally Interdisciplinary Research Network and the co-editor of the journal Migration and Society. Elena is currently the principal investigator of research projects that examine South-South migrations, including analyzing South-South humanitarian responses to displacement from Syria, views from Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, and local community experiences of and responses to displacement from Syria. Her most recent publications include The Ideal Refugees, Gender, Islam, and the Sahrawi Politics of Survival from the Syracuse University Press 2014, and Refuge in a Moving World, Tracing Refugee and Migrant Journeys Across Disciplines from the UCLA Press 2020. Our discussant is Rawan Arar, an assistant professor in the Department of Law, Societies, and Justice at University of Washington. She explores refugee displacement as a manifestation of the breakdown of borders and citizenship rights. She's the author of the Grand Compromise, how the, how the Syrian refugees changed the stakes in the global refugee assistance regime and leveraging sovereignty, Jordan and the Syrian refugee crisis. We are very happy to have Elena and Ravan for a conversation after the video. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you to all of the organizers and, and to all of you for a very warm welcome. And thank you to all of you who are joining from around the world and I'm very much looking forward to our conversations. 
I'd just like to echo that too. Thank you so much for having us and for creating the space for us to learn together. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. I'm looking forward to our conversation. And now without further ado, we bring to you Elena Fidian Kasmia's presentation. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. My name is Professor Elena Fidian Kasmia, and I am Professor of Migration and Refugee Studies at University College London in the Geography Department there, where I am Principal Investigator of the Refugee Hosts Research Project, and also Principal Investigator of the Southern Responses to Displacement Project. Both of these projects build upon my long-standing interest, um, including as part of those projects, in focusing on responses to displacement which have been developed by actors from across the global south, including by developing a multi-scalar analysis of the roles played by southern states, by local host communities, by faith-based networks and by refugees themselves. Indeed, as we know, displacement is itself primarily a southern phenomenon and responses to displacement also often are characterised by South-South dynamics, um, including um, historical examples of the ways that Southern actors have rejected, resisted and provided alternatives to hegemonic aid regimes. For instance, my research in the Middle East and in the Caribbean has examined state-led responses to displacement, such as Cuba's and Malaysia's responses to Palestinian, Sahrawi and Syrian refugees. Noting the importance of a multi-scalar framework, including the responses developed by states such as Cuba and Malaysia, but also regional organisations and municipalities, today I will be focusing on the importance of analysing experiences of and responses to displacement with attention to what I call refugee-refugee relationality. Drawing on the case of refugees from Syria who have sought refuge in a Palestinian refugee camp in North Lebanon since uh, 2011, which is part of a broader research project examining local community responses to displacement from Syria in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, I will be examining the dynamics and limitations that underpin processes of refugees hosting refugees um, and or forms of refugee-refugee humanitarianism, which are both concepts which I work with in my own research. So in doing so, my research problematizes um, studies of and responses to displacement, which often either view refugees in isolation or solely in relation to hosts, where the host is conceptualized as a citizen qua host, um, a citizen hosting the non-citizen. And instead, um, my, my work argues that focusing on the nature and implications of refugee-refugee relationality entails shifting our gaze away from rela relationships which have become archetypal in the field of refugee studies um, and also in refugee response. And, and instead, I argue that this focus on refugee-refugee relationality and other forms of Southern-led responses to displacement can actually challenge dominant and exclusionary Northern humanitarian um, paradigms um, of refugee studies and refugee response. So the key question um, underpinning our research is how, why and with what effect local communities in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey have been responding to displacement from Syria. And um, this is, I think, an important question to ask in relation to overlapping displacement in the Middle East. So what we see in the Middle East, as we do in many other regions of the world, are consecutive and intersecting conflicts and processes of displacement with the implication of these consecutive and intersecting conflicts, meaning that um, displacement is simultaneously often protracted in nature, that's to say um, lasting a long, um, a long period, many, many years and often decades, um, and also that as um, displacement endures for longer periods of time, in a context where most displaced people are not living in isolated refugee camps, but rather live in cities, towns, peri-urban areas, we have a particular dynamic of tempo-spatial relationality. That's to say that people who have been displaced live for a long time alongside other people who both have and have not experienced displacement. Um, they share these spaces um, between refugees and um, non-refugees through processes of what I call overlapping displacement. And this is one of the processes that we have been exploring in the Refugee Hosts Research Project. Yeah. <laughs> 
And one of the key features that arises in contexts of overlapping displacement is that individuals, families and um, collectivities or communities often experience displacement and share spaces for a long period of time. And this means that refugees um, themselves often become members of localities or communities which subsequently welcome and offer protection and support to other groups of displaced people. As indicated on this slide, refugees were, are and will be hosts and in turn hosts often have histories of displacement. This simultaneously um, leads us to interrogate the notions of refugee and host as two discrete categories and instead identifies the relationalities between these concepts and labels and also um, prompts us to think about the implications of these intersecting processes of displacement and hosting for policy and practice. So my research, um, as I've just said, is interested in refugee-refugee relationality, refugees hosting refugees, and refugee-refugee humanitarianism. And my research shifts the gaze away from the relations between refugees on the one hand and citizens, states, and institutions on the other. This focus on refugee host communities challenges the frequent depiction, assumption and construction of active citizens, NGOs and states, um, providing support to passive refugees by centralizing the role of refugee communities as providers of assistance, solidarity and support, including, as I'll come back to later, in situations of structural inequality and precarity. The Refugee Hosts Project has been conducting research in nine communities, um, one of which is uh, Badawi Refugee Camp in North Lebanon, where my interlocutors, or our interlocutors, including um, many refugees who have arrived from Syria to this camp, um, indicating that we arrived in the camp and we just passed through Lebanon. That in fact, Badawi Camp was their destination point um, for various reasons, including in order to bypass the restrictive um, policies and um, restrictions that exist within non camp areas, as it were, in, in the country. Um, our um, writer in residence on the refugee host project, Yusuf Mustafa Kaspia, who was himself born in Badawi refugee camp, um, elucidates uh, many of the dynamics that we find in Badawi um, beautifully in this um, poem, Writing the Camp, which I will read an extract um, from to you now. Refugees ask other refugees, who are we to come to you and who are you to come to us? Nobody answers. Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis, Kurds share the camp, the same different camp, the camp of a camp. They have all come to reoriginate the beginning with their own hands and feet. Now, this notion of reoriginating the beginning um, highlights the extent to which people are often always already in the middle of displacement. So, for example, 15,000 Palestinian refugees from the Nahr al barid refugee camp in Lebanon were internally displaced to and hosted in Badawi when their camp was destroyed in 2007. This means that 10,000 refugees from Nahr al barid currently form part of the refugee community in Badawi who are hosting refugees from Syria who arrived in 2011. So in the case of the Nahr al barid refugees in Badawi, we can see that these are internally displaced refugees hosted by refugees who are now hosting refugees. These are intersecting processes of precarity and um, interrupting um, processes of the refugee host um, binary, which is often reproduced in conceptualizations and in policy frameworks. So how can we understand these processes of overlapping displacement and hosting on a lived level? Well, here we have an interview extract from a Palestinian from Nahr al barid camp who has been resident in Badawi since 2007. Um, and I'll, I'll read his words um, now. While I was still in Nahr al barid camp, my original place of residence, I hosted five Palestinian families displaced from Beirut in 2006 for a whole month. We shared everything with them, the rooms of the house and the food until they returned to their homes. When we left Nahr al barid in 2007, the people poured into Badawi camp in just one day. And the people here in Badawi were waiting for us to lend a helping hand and to help secure shelter for us. In 2012, I hosted a Syrian family in my house for 15 days until I secured them a house of their own 
I offered them food, clothes and necessary supplies during that entire period. So over the course of six years, this Palestinian man hosted six displaced families in his own home and also directly experienced internal displacement and was hosted by other refugees in Badawi refugee camp. A clear reminder both of the precarity of many people's lives in displacement and of the diverse ways that refugees respond to support the needs and rights of diverse people affected by conflict and forced migration. And yet an important element that arises in terms of studying local or southern um, level uh, responses to refugees is also significant in methodological terms when viewed through the frame of what I call the poetics of undisclosed care and the extent to which acts of kindness and solidarity may be viewed as private acts which should not be disclosed to others. This discrete mode of supporting refugees is as strongly grounded in religious belief and practice in many instances, as it is a powerful counterpoint to the international humanitarian system's long-standing preference for hyper-visible logos and public announcements of action. So here I will read a few extracts from um, some of our interviewees in Badawi. So a Palestinian from Nahr al um, said, we collected clothes, offered food and cash to refugees, but I hope you won't mention this except for reasons related to your research, because we do this only for God's sake. In turn, a Syrian refugee living in Badawi camp said, those people who offer assistance without disclosing their names deserve respect. And in turn, a Kurdish refugee from Syria living in Badawi camp said, be like the good tree that gives its fruit and does not ask who took them. At the same time as um, documenting and archiving the ways that people support other people, this does not mean that we need to idealise this situation, a situation which is ultimately unsustainable and which is characterised by unequal responses. So here I'll read an extract from a, an interview with a Palestinian resident of Badawi camp whose um, family was in fact displaced from Tripoli 60 years ago after, um, after the Abu Ali River flooded and destroyed Khan al where they had lived before. This interviewee said, when the displaced people from Nahr al came, the, door of the or the doors of the local associations and institutions opened. The people from Nahr al were received with open hearts. The local community mobilised and interacted extensively at all levels to provide support for the local people. They provided the first assistance, food, mattresses, blankets, while for the displaced people from Syria, none of this was offered. Newer arrivals in the camp have understood the differences in response. This Kurdish refugee from Syria said, when we arrived, the situation in Badawi camp was tragic. Before we arrived here from Syria, the residents of the camp received Palestinian refugees from Nahr al and provided them with lots of assistance, but they did not provide us with this assistance on the grounds that there are international stakeholders responsible for the Syrian refugees. Indeed, a Palestinian resident explained that, I quote, I have not provided any assistance to refugees from Syria. I am personally in need of support whereas the displaced people from Syria are provided with that support from many groups. Although, in fact, this international assistance is very limited in nature, there is a widespread assumption that exists in the camp that people from Syria receive a variety of forms of assistance. And indeed, there is a bifurcated model of assistance in a space such as Badawi camp, where Syrians receive different forms of assistance from, for example, Palestinians or Palestinians from Syria as well. So there is this level of understanding of the limits of, um, of the ability to respond after so many different processes of displacement, of hosting, of displacement and hosting. So here, the Syrian um, refugee living in Badawi camp said, the local communities here in Badawi camp are also in a deplorable situation and also suffer from poverty. They cannot meet their own needs. How can they provide in-kind and financial assistance to others? We only ask them for good treatment and non-discrimination between refugees on the basis of their political affiliations, which had been seen in some instances in the camp. The institutions here are meant to provide assistance, and we would like them to provide assistance in a professional way. So where providing material assistance um, and material aid 
distributing iftar baskets, for example, and supporting people in times of loss and mourning have been increasingly visible and legible as forms of response, as I have documented elsewhere in my research. A related question is what is perceived as a response and indeed as an acceptable form of response by different actors. So this Syrian interviewee indicated that I think that the biggest part of the local community does not care about this and their role does not transgress the limits of observing. And here the question that arises um, is whether observing without caring can be conceptualized as a response. Um, and we may shift that question to whether it can be viewed as an acceptable or sufficient form of response. What is the relative significance from the perspective of different interlocutors of the provision of material goods, of spiritual support, of conviviality, of caring and of sharing space? Who determines what is enough in such a situation of overlapping precarity? Is it sufficient, as Yusuf and Kasmia and I have been exploring as part of the Refugee Hosts Project, for responses to be framed around being with and being together following Jean-Luc Nancy? Is it to accept one another's presence, to offer moral support and to greet one another each morning? I'll read this interview extract from a Kurdish refugee from Syria living in Badawi camp. It is enough that they allowed us to live among them despite this great population pressure. In my view, the local community is not interested in providing us with assistance. All they have to do is accept our presence in these areas and to offer us moral support. For me, it is enough that my Palestinian neighbour greets me every morning and that I go to work being sure that my children are well among their foreign neighbours. Now, of course, throughout these many different processes, people displaced from Syria have themselves been providing support to other people displaced from the same conflict residing in Badawi, as is the case of this Kurdish refugee from Syria. I did not receive any assistance from the host community or local aid organisations, but I received that through another Kurdish family. They were also displaced, but had arrived in the camp six months before me. This Kurdish family support for me can be summarised in the fact that my family and I were hosted at their house for a full month and they provided food for us at their personal expense during that period. So another important ethical question that I believe arises um, is what the implications are of documenting the agency of people who have been displaced, the ways that these people respond to their own needs and those of other people at a time precisely when humanitarian funding is being cut. Does this demonstration of a form of self-reliance, as it were, provide a justification for international actors, northern actors, not to respond? Well, for me, focusing on the structural inequalities and the structural barriers that prevent people from being able to identify and enact solutions for their own prob problems is particularly important in this regard. So in my broader research, trying to bring those structural conditions and barriers to the forefront is what I've been trying to do in conjunction with documenting and archiving the actions, demonstrations, conceptualizations, and the counter narratives that are developed by people who have been displaced. These actions and counter narratives challenge hegemonic humanitarian discourses and the political rhetoric that restricts people's rights and freedoms. Indeed, as our interlocutors have repeatedly stressed, I think that providing assistance should be limited to government organisations only, as for the local community, the most it can do is to treat displaced people well. Repeatedly, our interlocutors aimed to hold international and governmental actors responsible and accountable acknowledging the limits of the capacity of local communities to respond. Um, can be um, held very closely in line with holding those um, international and government actors responsible. A second interviewee um, said, um, I think that it is a public responsibility. It is the responsibility of the UN and all organisations and titles with humanitarian titles, with the term humanitarian in their titles. When the local community is destitute and poor, it is mostly not responsible for offering relief to anyone, and it only has some secondary roles. And this is in itself an achievement. I appreciate what the local community has done in relation to the capacities of the others. It is significant work and deserves to be appreciated. <laughs> 
and I echoed those words, this is indeed itself an achievement. It is significant work, and it does deserve to be, deserve to be appreciated. And indeed, it deserves to be appreciated even more so, precisely given the extent to which these responses have been taking place in situations of extreme precarity. And this precarity is not merely because of displacement, but often precisely because of the barriers and hierarchies introduced and reproduced by state and non-state actors um, around the world. And indeed, as I have argued elsewhere, hospitality and rejection are not inevitable, but rather um, we need to identify and trace alternative modes of thought and action that transcend and resist the fatalistic invocations of hospitality, to, to follow um, Derrida's work. And it requires tracing the ways that tension and inequality are created by international and national policies um, and by intersecting structures of inequality and oppression. So in conclusion, and looking forward to our conversations following this, um, this video, um, when we shift our gaze towards the actions of um, the Global South, um, or of actors in the Global South, we must do so by recognising a number of um, realities and processes. Firstly, displacement situations intersect, and they must be viewed in relation rather than in isolation. Secondly, refugees are, were, will be hosts, and vice versa. Hosts have often experienced displacement, hence the term refugee hosts, with that hyphen in the middle. Thirdly, tensions and hostility are created through politics, policies and programmes, and through exclusionary modes of representation. And we need to identify and imagine alternative modes of, of relationships. And um, fourthly, shifting the gaze towards responses developed by actors in the global south does not mean looking away from the responsibilities of actors in the global north or northern actors. So many thanks for listening and I very much look forward to our um, conversations. If you are interested, please do also look at the Refugee Hosts website and our Twitter account and please do join our community of conversation online as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. And also thank you to our organizers for bringing us here today so that we can discuss uh, your work. So first and foremost, what I love about this work is that it actually reflects a reality that is often known by the people who are living it and yet is neglected in the literature, in policy making, and often in uh, humanitarian knowledge production, which underpins so much of the scholarly work that we do in refugee studies. Um, your work not only introduces us to new empirical findings, but the descriptions of refugee hosts um, has deep theoretical significance that can inspire us to think critically about some of the most basic questions when it comes to refugee studies. And these questions, um, despite being basic, are, are often still unresolved. Um, so I'd like to think through some of these things with you in our discussion. Um, so the study of refugee displacement is filled with dichotomies. We have refugee versus migrant, refugee versus citizen, refugee versus IDP. And we know why these dichotomies exist. They serve a purpose. So from a legal perspective, we know that the, the refugee category is a special category that allows people access to certain kinds of rights and resources when they cross a, a state border. Um, from a humanitarian perspective, being able to count and identify refugees uh, is important when it comes to the mechanisms of providing aid. And, and for this question, I want to focus mostly on the perspective of actors um, in the Global South, especially state actors in the Global South. Um, in approaching what it, the, the, the practice of breaking down this dichotomy, um, I am struck by thinking about what role does it play for uh, Southern actors, specifically uh, Southern state actors. So um, it is very clear that Southern state actors are incentivized to make their refugee hosting capacity legible. And I'm curious, in your opinion, to what extent uh, do you think that this dichotomy allows um, these actors to make that their refugee hosting capacity legible. And I suppose I want to um, follow up this question by, by making the point that 
what kind of resistance do you imagine um, one will face and when trying to move away from the refugee host dichotomy and to focus on um, refugee dash hosts, right? So let's let's start there and then I can ask you some follow-up questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rowan. That's very generous words um, again. Um, so I think that um, for many states, as, as you say, for many states around the world, um, highlighting the limits of their capacity um, is a very powerful, strategic, political and economic bargaining tool that is used, whether it's a European state um, or a state in the so-called global south, which justifies the implementation of border closures, um, of restrictive policies of all sorts, but also requests for additional funding from other um, regional organizations and international groups. So whether it's uh, a country in the EU um, identifying um, a particular discourse which can justify requesting additional funds from the European Union, or whether it is a global south um, state highlighting um, or um, explaining in a particular discursive um, form the limits of its capacity to request additional funds from the World Bank or from um, the UN, then this is a strategy that um, we find around the world, absolutely. And there are many different instances where states have um, used different bargaining tools, whether it is the threat of border closures or the threat of opening those borders um, to secure financial and political deals and bargains which benefit the state but do not offer protection to people and in fact often are premised on undermining the the rights of the the people who are being um, discursively mobilized in in those uh, rhetorical um, statements and those political statements so we can think of examples from as i say from around the world but this is not unique to the global south we see um North American states, we see European states using similar rhetoric to um, explain that there are limits to what we can do and therefore we require additional financial um, uh, and material forms of support and we are justified in implementing repressive um, responses which are introducing new structural barriers which um, undermine human rights. So absolutely I, I do think that that, that is um, that, that presentation of the restricted um, ability to, to host others is used as mobilized, is, is strategically um, um, utilized on, on different levels. And that given that that is a helpful rhetoric um, from a political standpoint, there would be resistance to any disruption in those binaries, which as you say, they do work for um, in particular powerful actors. Those categories serve bureaucratic purposes, they serve operational purposes, they serve programmatic purposes for the, the um, actors who have that power to label, to categorize, to count, to um, determine who is worthy or unworthy. But these categories are in turn contested, rejected, strategically mobilized by people on the ground, people who will seek refugee status will want to be labeled a refugee to secure legal rights, but will reject the categorization, which is so deeply imbued with negative connotations and which can lead to vulnerability on other levels insofar as being identified as a refugee can lead to violence and death in many instances. So there is an ambivalent relationship with these labels. There is an ambivalent relationship with these categories, um, which will be resisted by states on the one hand, by individuals and communities on the other at different um, times and, and different moments. You know, as I was um, learning from your work, I was remembering uh, being in Jordan in 2009 and 2010 when um, there were uh, a good number of Iraqi refugees and there was this um, symbol. I tried to find it online for you. I don't know, maybe some of our participants might be able to find an image of this, but it's three hands and they're they're grasping one another. It's almost like a triangle and it's a Jordanian flag, a Palestinian flag, flag and an Iraqi flag. And the idea is, is that, you know, we're all in this together. And it struck me as a very interesting example of refugee hosts, at least, you know, when including the Palestinians, right, especially. Um, and so I feel like in breaking down this dichotomy, you have really um, inspired me to think about other ways in which refugee hosts exist in these spaces. Um, I was also thinking about 
um, uh, UNRWA and the, the essentially refugees who work as humanitarian aid workers, right? Or thinking about um, my most recent work with um, humanitarian aid workers in Jordan who are responding to Syrian displacement many of whom are Palestinian Jordanian. So they too have a refugee history. So I, I was just thinking about, um, you know, starting with this presentation that you um, shared with us, expanding that further and further. I think this notion of refugee host um, can be applied to populations that, that weren't even included in this, uh, you know, because it's 20 minutes, you know, the short presentation. But um, yeah, I was, I was hoping you could reflect a little bit on that too. All the other ways in which there, this binary between refugees and hosts is just so um, inaccurate, you know, in, in many different instances. Yeah, absolutely. And the examples that you've drawn upon from your own research illustrate that beautifully. Um, so we do, we see this again, this is not limited to the, um, to the Middle East and, and North Africa. This is something that we find around the world. Um, people do not belong to one particular category, of course, um, people have complex histories. Um, and the, the notion of a citizen being somebody who's fixed in place and has access to specific rights is a very restricted one. Um, and I know that your work, again, has interrogated um, notions of citizenship and, and practices on, on different levels. So refugee hosts, absolutely is in it's it's a conceptual device in many regards i'm not aiming to multiply labels um but rather to interrogate those and to really stress the relationality that exists between people's um lives between processes across time and place um and it's it's a problematic term in many regards because it reifies those particular labels in an attempt to problematize them so rather than having refugees on the one hand and hosts on the other we end up with the hyphen in the middle joining them together in a way that may be actively and probably is actively resisted by, um, by, by people who are navigating and leading their lives in, in these situations. So the aim isn't to create another label, but as you say, to, to just to, to disrupt those binaries and to think in another way, to, to, to ask the question, well, what happens if we actually start from the premise, refugees are hosts, hosts are refugees, and then what? What what do we what do we do with that? What we do, do what do we do with it as academics? What do we do with it as people who engage in solidarity um, uh, um, actions, networks, um, processes? What do we do when we're interacting with or we are ourselves um, writing policy documentation or or programmatic um, documentation? What operational impact could this have as well? And it makes life more complicated in some regards, but it also brings us back to the key issue that actually we should be prioritizing protection and rights. So who has protection needs and how can political systems that create particular vulnerabilities and risks be um, addressed so that those structural barriers are redressed and there are political solutions to political problems rather than the ongoing rhetoric um, and discourse of humanitarianism being needed to save people um, through band-aids effectively. What are the political solutions? And, and that's, I think, one of the things that, that I aim to, to do in highlighting the structural inequalities and the structural barriers that lead to the multiplication of these bureaucratic categories without recognizing the complex um, ways that people are always and already responding to their own lives and the lives of their neighbors and the people that they live alongside and people that they've never met, strangers as well. Sorry, very long um, response to that um, excellent question from you. It, it, it's great. Your, your, um, your response took me back to another point that you made in your um, presentation about how uh, we have to just think about displacement as ongoing. I'm, I wrote down the exact words you said. Is this, they're not um, always in the always in the middle, always in the middle of displacement. And I think that that actually is also a very powerful conceptual framing. Um, and in terms of political interventions or, or uh, when the humanitarian and the political meet, I was thinking about the Jordan Compact and um, essentially how the Jordan Compact uh, for, for those who, um, don't know what that is. It was essentially a compromise uh, it, where Jordan um, received increased aid and uh, they agreed to create job opportunities for Syrian refugees and also educational opportunities. But 
those were only for Syrian refugees. And then there were all of these other consequences for other refugees who essentially fell outside of you know, the camera's golden light or the framing of um, the refugee. There was the hosts, there was the refugees, and then the other refugee populations were essentially neglected. And so when we do think about always in the middle of displacement, I, I think that that's um, not just a window, that's a whole door into just constantly being aware of the other populations that are um, of, of less interest to donor states that are investing in uh, the humanitarian responses that are, of course, political. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we, in fact, we know empirically that people's vulnerability to poverty, to health crises, um, to violations of human rights actually increase over time in displacement. They, they don't decrease. It's actually typically in, in context of protracted displacement in particular, obviously, but, you know, people's needs people's um, um, requirements actually become more complex over time. And that's precisely as humanitarian assistance becomes less available because they are no longer in the top 10 um, refugee crises, which are on the international radar. And that's, again, the, the problem with those labels. Who is the good refugee? Who is the ideal refugee of that particular moment? Who is in the spotlight and who is rendered invisible precisely by um, focusing on particular categories of people? Um, on particular nationalities, on particular um, conflict situations, wh whilst ignoring precisely the um, the ongoing precarity that many people live with and live in um, over over time. Um, and I know again that your your work has been um, exploring these these questions. Um, and again, it's something that resonates around the world. It, it's not limited to the Middle East. Um, we see it everywhere, effectively. I could ask you a million more questions, but I feel like I need to give someone else a, a chance here. So I'm going to hand over the, the platform to our postdoctoral fellow, fellow uh, Goze Bourjou Ed Edge. Thank you, Ravan. Thank you, Elena. It was such an insightful discussion and conversation, and I'm going to listen to it many times. <laughs> um, so we have received a lot of interesting questions, and I will try to kind of pick up common threads and bring them to your attention. Uh, one question that struck out uh, is so that it takes us to a different realm a little bit is about methodology. Uh, first, uh, there's a thank you uh, for your great presentation in this comment. And then uh, the question asks, could you say a bit more about what you referred to in the talk as a documentary practices you are using to make the experience of refugees visible or legible? Your presentation included poetry, images, and quotes. Are these different genres used differently? And are they meant for different audiences? Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny, for your question. Thank you, Burjou, for, um, for again, for your wonderful introduction there. And thanks to Rawan for a fantastic conversation, which I'm also going to look forward to continuing in a different Different, um, different space. Um, so Danny, this is um, this is part of the interdisciplinary framework of the research project that we've been developing, where we have attempted to view different disciplines as equal partners in a conversation, and um, with the different disciplines pushing, um, or the different um, methods and different insights coming from the different disciplines, pushing us as team members um, to think differently about our own original approaches. So for example, when I started the refugee host project, I very much entered as a social scientist who prioritized ethnography, um, interviews, participant observation, um, workshops, etc. And the writer in residence, uh, Yusuf Mustafa Kosmiya, was going to be leading the writing elements um, with our um, co-investigator, Professor Lindsay Stonebridge. And we were going to be focusing primarily on writing and on the, the interviews. And we were going to be holding uh, writing workshops with um, people from Syria and people from the, um, the local hosting communities in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. I've come out at the other end of a four year research project, having taken um, several thousand photographs which have become a mode of an analysis. So not just a mode of documenting um, people's um, lives, but actually asking questions through the photographs that, um, that I've been taking. Um, we've been, I, I've been recording soundscapes 
of um, the, the different places where we've been doing research and what it means to listen to displacement. So each method actually has pushed me to think differently about the original questions that I had drafted in the grant application for this research project, for example. So we have been um, bringing poetry, images, sound, interviews together as equal partners in this conversation and recognizing that each of those methods can bring additional insight and can complement and also push um, one another to, to be interpreted differently and to be um, mobilized in different ways, as it were. So I, I would say that use of poetry can encapsulate um, the dynamics in Badawi camp in three lines, um, much more eloquently and dynamically than five pages of my academic prose. Um, and I think that it's also captured a lot of attention from different audiences precisely because poetry can do something that academic writing can't do for many different reasons. And um, Yusuf and I have developed um, poetry and photography in, in conversation as well, so photo, photo poetic reflections, which have become ways of seeing together. So developing what we call the third gaze. So what does it mean for a photographer, social scientist, um, European um, academic, um, and a, a scholar, poet, um, born in Badawi camp, to, to bring together the photography and the poetry, to see together that context of displacement from our different positionalities, and to actually interrogate um, what it means to, to look at that reality of displacement and of hosting together. So the genres are used differently insofar as they document different elements of the process, um, but it is a similar process of displacement which we've been exploring and with the similar questions which we've developed together um, over, over the course of the research project. And um, we, we've always wanted all of those um, genres, as, as you've labeled them, to be meant for the same audiences, that a policymaker at UNHCR Geneva should be as interested in the poetry and in the photography as they should be in the, you know, the 75% of all refugees said X, you know, that the numerical value should not be given precedence over the writing of um, a Syrian living in Zarqa, for example, in, in Jordan, and how they recount their own experience and that of their neighbors in a short story. That that is equally valid in terms of representing um, the experiences and the responses that are developed by people who've experienced displacement. Um, so um, do have a look at the um, creative archive, which is on the Refugee Hosts website. Um, and we've tried to we try to bring it together um, rather than viewing them as separate um, separate methods, as it were, and separate entry points. And it's still ongoing. Our analysis is still ongoing, and our out outputs, which is a horrible term, um, are still um, still being developed. But thanks for your question, Danny. Thank you for such a wonderful answer. Um, now, uh, I want to take us to a little bit of a different realm, uh, realm of politics a little bit. So this is again a combination of uh, two questions. Um, so the question says that, what about Muslim states in the region and humanitarian coalitions in the global south? Are they ever called upon to provide help? Are these organizations in the global south that have the ability and will to mobilize aid on behalf of Syrian refugees? And if so, where do they figure in your analysis? And as a follow-up, somebody else asks, curious about views on the roles and effectiveness of Saudi and UAE Red Crescents for Syri Syrian refugees in Lebanon and displaced persons in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the, um, the refugee hosts project that I refer to is primarily looking at local community responses. So it's been looking at how the residents of nine neighborhoods effectively in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey have been responding to the arrival and ongoing presence of, of people displaced from Syria. Um, the sister project, as it were, of refugee hosts is the Southern Responses to Displacement Project, um, whose full title is Analyzing South-South Humanitarian Responses to Displacement. And that also uses uh, or also ex examines um, the case of displacement from Syria, but uses a multi-scalar form of analysis, which looks at local responses, um, but also how those local responses relate to um, the responses developed by actors on the national level, whether they are municipal or governmental, 
um, or state led, um, and also um, regional responses and what I would frame as South South responses. So, as I mentioned briefly in one of the slides, how Cuba provides responses, um, or how Brazil, um, for example, which um, Estela Carpi and I are uh, writing an article on at the moment, um, Estela is the, um, the research associate on the research project with me. Um, so, looking at those states and also looking at Malaysia, for example, which has provided assistance again, which I included on the slide, um, to Palestinians and uh, Syrians. Uh, across time. So we have been looking at um, how people displaced from Syria and how residents of those nine local communities in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey themselves perceive and conceptualize um, the work that is done, the, the assistance that is offered by a variety of actors from the global south. Now, the vast majority of our interlocutors, and we, we have about 300 interviews done so far by, um, by researchers who are residents of um, the, the neighborhoods and the areas where, where the research is taking place. Um, so most of our interlocutors are not aware of many um, southern state responses, as it were. The most visible ones certainly are the Gulf states which have very well established bureaucracies, logos, systems, which mean that you, you know, I, I can I can walk through the street, the alleyways of Badawi refugee camp and spot which children have received um, assistance from, from Saudi because they have logos on their backpacks and on their jackets. So you can spot that as clearly as you can spot the assistance from the UN, which also has its physical stamp on it, as it were. But most people are not aware, for example, of the assistance that's provided by Malaysia. They may be aware that it, it comes that they receive assistance from um, Beit Atfal Samud, for example, but they're not aware that that is actually supported by the Malaysian government. So that's an example of a, a Muslim state which provides assistance, but it's not necessarily perceived or recognized as a provider of aid. Um, there are some states which are which are more visible, um, but as a whole, our interlocutors, which is my part, my my key interest in the Southern Responses Project, is not what I think about how Saudi provides aid or how Brazil does or doesn't respond, or how um, other members um, of the um, organization of the Islamic of the OIC provide assistance, etc. What I'm interested in is how people who've been displaced and who are ostensibly beneficiaries of this assistance, how they conceptualize that aid. And the big challenge that is arising in that research project is that most people aren't aware of um, where that assistance is coming from on a state level. Um, and it's, um, it's that's part of the challenge at the moment, uh, which we're going through. Um, Estela, who I think is still on, on the line, um, is um, go, going through the interviews that we've um, collected so far um, with the help of our, of our colleagues in um, Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey and the interviews that she and I have conducted as well. Um, so we'll have a better answer to that question probably in about a year, where I probably will be able to say, well, about 15% of our interlocutors said X. Um, but one of the big biggest challenges is precisely in documenting well, what is taking place and how is that relevant for me to know what is taking place versus what a person living in a displacement situation is aware of and whether they think it's important which is one of the questions that we are ask, you know, is it important that you're receiving the bread basket from Saudi versus from the Turkish government or from the local mosque? Is that relevant to you? You know, how do you conceptualize the providers of assistance? And is this just a question that is of interest to, um, to European and North American scholars, or is it something that is conceptualized as actually being significant who the provider of assistance is from the perspective of, um, of people who've been displaced themselves? So that's a, that's a great question. It's not a very clear answer because the research is ongoing. Um, and I'd, you know, I'd love to um, uh, hear more from different people's experiences. And I flagged the uh, refugee hosts um, community of conversation in, in my presentation, but the Southern Responses to Displacement um, Project um, also has a, a blog where we um, are very happy to host um, submissions, um, uh, short reflections on the responses that are provided by different actors from across the Global South. So if anybody would like to submit something, have a look at www.southernresponses.org and we'd be happy to, um, to receive submissions. Back to you, Bourjou. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so there's a question about, we keep talking about the displaced and uh, their relationship with the organizations, different organizations. There's a question about uh, co-optation actually. So 
This question asks that, for example, Turkmen, Iraqis who were displaced are often placed in position of some authority as translator and administrators in Turkey. Displaced Turkmen Iraqis are often seen as the favorite competitors to Syrians, Afghan, Somalian people who are displaced. This question asks, how does such institutional co-optation co of one group of displaced over the other impact their ro role as host? That, that's a, a great, great question. And the question of co-optation exists um, across so many different levels. This is one of the ways in which tensions are created effectively by different bureaucratic and political decisions. And the institutionalization of particular groups of people as having access to um, not just jobs, but as you say, authority, positions of power over other people, and the prioritization of, of certain um, individuals over others, irrespective of the, the skills and the, um, the, the capacities that they might have, prioritizing people on the basis of nationality, ethnicity, um, etc., can lead to very significant tensions and can destabilize um, activities and dynamics which have been arising on an everyday level in, in local, um, local neighbourhoods, for example. Um, so co-optation can play part of this. Um, it, I think it's still important to position it within that multi-scalar framework. So this isn't taking place in isolation. This is taking place within a broader set of policies and programmes and politics and why a particular group of people is being prioritized over others um, within that broader macro scale, as it were. So I, I'm always interested in, in how those relationalities compound and accentuate um, different dynamics, whether it leads to greater access to protection or whether it leads to the destabilization and the creation and reproduction of tensions and inequalities. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question, absolutely. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are kind of coming towards the end of our time. I want to pose one more question, a quick question with a quick, quick answer, if possible. And this goes to more about like empowerment and agency. Uh, the question asks, could you, uh, how can refugees be given more leadership roles within camps? This seems to get at the white savior idea, they say. Uh, will come in and help you in the way we think best. How can the NGO paradigm shift to include care from the perspective of the refugee needing it? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the key questions that the humanitarian world is facing at the moment. It isn't a new one. In, uh, for example, it was institutionalized in the so-called localization of aid agenda, which was, um, was key in the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, almost a decade ago now. So um, the increasing commitment that the international humanitarian regime has given to ensuring that local actors um, often used as an equivalent for or synonym for the local state, which is equivalent to the southern state in this context, rather than further down, as it were, um, but also often including municipalities, for example, that commitment to provide funding directly to local slash southern actors um, has been institutionalized. But there is a much bigger shift that has to has to take place. And it's, it's something that's being debated at the moment in all of the headquarters officially um, of um, international organizations etc but ultimately what is required is relinquishing power um, on, on behalf of international organizations and recognizing that just as refugees are always already in the middle of displacement they are always already leading their own responses and what the humanitarian aid system has done is erase from view and undermine the ways that people are always already acting to support themselves, their neighbors and strangers. And that has got to be addressed. Um, why, though, wh why that political benefit to the humanitarian infrastructure has been grounded on that uh, rendering invisible of local responses, of Southern responses, et cetera, and the prioritization of the ongoing need in inverted commas of humanitarian actors being international um, often white, European, North American um, saviors coming in to reproduce slash destroy the local responses that are already taking place. That wasn't a, a very quick response and it also wasn't a complete response, um, but I think that is one of the key challenges that is being faced. 
because people are already responding to their own needs and their own rights. Um, and what needs to be um, supported is ensuring that those responses are sustainable and do not reproduce again systems of inequality and vulnerability. Thank you. That was a very thought pro provoking response. Thank you so much. Awesome. And now I'm turning over to Arzu to conclude this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with this last question, we have reached the end of today's webinar, sadly. Uh, we'd like to thank professors Elena Fedian Lesmia and Professor Rowan Arar for a wonderful conversation that launched this terrific discussion uh, with the Q&A. We'd also like to thank our technical organizers, especially Caitlin Palo, and all of you for your continued interest. And we look forward to hosting you in two weeks on February 4th at 3.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, when we will welcome professors Amira Mittermeier and Sienna Craig, who will speak on the ethics of care in Egypt and the Himalayas. On behalf of all the organizers, we wish everyone a good day and thank you again.